I'm honored tonight to bring to this pulpit my son in the gospel. I have a lot of sons in the gospel. I love every one of them. Brother Alexander Amy, we love you at Praise Tabernacle. Bring us the word of the Lord. Come right now. Hallelujah. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. Lord. Let's do something different. Everybody in this building, walk around this building one time, please. I'm not joking. Please. Just make one lap around this building. Move around. Get the blood going in your body. Think about every one of these chairs that you walk by that someone used to sit in. Think about every time you've been in this building and a prayer's been answered in a different spot. Think about the people you prayed with that got the Holy Ghost in a spot in here. Think about the visions you got in certain areas in this church. We are a church that is alive. We are a church that is moving forward. We are people of the name. We are not shipwrecked today. We're not capsized. We're not floating on a raft in the middle of the ocean. We're not laying in a hospital bed with a nurse coming in saying, you thinking of living is a long shot. We are people that know that there is a God who does nothing but long shots. Hallelujah. Clap your hands unto the Lord and find yourself a seat. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Satan, you're alive. Jesus is on the throne and we know him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Heard a story of a, a country farmer. One day, he and his little boy went to the city for the first time. He and his little boy are standing next to this big, tall building. It's the elevator, the first one he's ever seen in his life. This elevator door opens up, and older lady comes out, and door closes, and Door opens up and a young lady comes out and door closes and another older lady comes out and she looks mean, she looks mad, she looks ugly and door closes and opens and a young beautiful woman comes out. So a farmer looks at the son he says, boy, go get your mom. It's nothing against my wife, it's nothing against your mama, but sometimes people want change in their life. And there's some people that don't understand how change takes place. There's some people that get comfortable doing things in a certain way. And we identify with things the way that we learn, the way that we're taught. But I'm here to tell you today, this world is in a desperate situation. The world we live in today has an identity crisis. The world we live in today has an identity crisis. We sing a song week in and week out, I know who I am. And I'm here to tell you today, church, I know who I am. Do you know who you are in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ? Clap your hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My daughter said, Daddy, are you going to turn red tonight? I don't know. You're going to yell? I don't know. I'm not in a rush to get out of here. I'm not looking forward to staying here all night each. But I do want to be sensitive to what the Holy Ghost wants. And he desires that we change a little bit. And he desires that we accept our position in him. Because this world is an identity crisis. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're all familiar with several brands, Nike, Starbucks, Adidas, Coach, Michael Force, Facebook, Twitter, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Walmart, Target, Coke, Pepsi, Apple, McDonald's. All these brands and labels we're familiar with. And these are brands that are successful in our eyes because they've been around, they've made a change, and They've made a lot of money, and the way that our mind is, is now this is how the norm is. It's successful, it's popular, it's in my face, so everything else that comes out is going to be judged. Get a cup of coffee, oh, it's good, but it's not as good as a frappuccino. 
Regardless if it's the finest chocolate on the globe, regardless to unrefined means, it's not Starbucks taste, so it's not as good as. This happens. And everything now that's similar is compared to what you're used to. In 1999, if you were a white boy in Iraq, you were compared to Eminem. Oh, you sound like Eminem. You preach? Oh, you sound like so-and-so. Oh, you're copying so-and-so. Things like this happen. We're compared to what we're used to. And the identity crisis that we're faced with today is the church. Christianity is identified with little men running around with hats defiling the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell the church today. We are in a desperate identity crisis in the world. Not in Las Vegas, not in Praise Tabernacle, but we as human beings in the year 2014. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our identity is being taken from us. It's been taken time in and time out, bit by bit, line upon line, it's being taken. Because people aren't standing for their name. They're not standing for what the appearance of evil is against it. You see, people are known by their identity, their brand. Starbucks, you see the green sign with the little mermaid lady in the crowd? There's a Starbucks. You see the golden arches? There's McDonald's. You see the swoosh? There's Nike. You see a camouflage shirt in the neighborhood around Nellis? They must be in the Air Force. Why? Because they're identified by what they're seen as. And the church, by default, should be seen as the church. Clean, cut, holy people living a separated life without a blunt in their mouth, without a cigarette in their mouth, without all these other things that defile the temple of God. This is what we should be seen as. But this is not what we're being seen as. Hallelujah. Companies invest astronomical amounts of money into their brand to build their label, to spread their name to have an appearance, to gain and maintain a reputation. 2013, it's reported that Nike spent $175 million on 10 people, just investing their brand into 10 people. You think this might be a lot of money, but it's 15% of what their gross revenue was for the year, meaning they got a great return on their investment. Upwards of 15%. Say, what does that mean to me? There's principles here. Invest yourself in the kingdom of God and give a return. You cannot go wrong. You cannot go wrong. Our God is faithful. Our God is just. He is a healer. He is a provider. He is a restorer. He ministers to every single need that we have that we can move by faith and bring them to him. But it's contingent upon us recognizing our identity and who he is and who we are in relation to him. We are in an identity crisis because we're being bamboozled and hoodwinked day in and day out to accept things as the norm. I don't know where you were up with the news on Sunday. Someone was drafted in the NFL, and there were the 249th person to be drafted. They don't live a life that I condone, but the media took note of this individual's lifestyle, who's in sin. And they blew it, and they're still running it all day, him and his relationship with the individual he lives with. What did what we've done is we put our focus on one person who happened to be the 249th person. Not the 248 other people that were better qualified, more desirable, better equipped. They were faster, stronger, more apt, and more able. But we focused on the one. And a lot of times that's what happens in the world is one preacher falls, so by default the church is corrupted. God's not real because someone took a little bit of money. Pastor mentioned on Sunday, a lot of times it's sad that I don't believe it's happening in this church, but throughout the world what happens is there's fried preacher after, after church on Sunday. 
For every preacher that falls, there must be 300, 500, 3,000 saints that have backslid and defiled the name. Think about it. Think about it, church. So this is what the world sees is people in church that used to be in church that are now over the club of them. There's an identity crisis going on that's an epidemic that has grown out of proportion. And this is reality. Say, why are you saying this? Because there is hope. But we must understand that it is happening. Yeah. And that we can change this by recognizing who we are and our identity as apostolics, as Christians, as people of the name, as Pentecostals. We read and we get so emotionally charged when we read, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And we shout, which is great. But what that power is, is the ability to overcome temptation that we're faced with so we no longer have to fall a victim to sin. Brother Ray were taught on Sunday, but God, but God make it a way for you to escape when you're faced with, with trials, tribulations, and temptations. That's the power of the Holy Ghost, is the ability to not fall into sin. And if we do, it's the ability to be comforted and, and be convicted instead of being stepped on and kicked to the curb and left out for dead. Because we've got a comfort. Who will be there for us to lean on? Who will be there to speak to us, to encourage us, to strengthen us? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know Nike because of the swoosh. And the ten people they invest on aren't even the best in business of what they do. But they help build the brand. And I said we can bamboozled because we'll go out and we'll pay $26 for a t-shirt to wear a billboard of their name. It's not a better quality cotton Amen. than you can go buy at the swap meet. It doesn't have anything on it. It's nuts. But it says Nike. And it's even sad because it falls into our minds. And that's the main thing is our mind needs to process what's going on and how we're being hoodwinked and bamboozled into this so-called status quo. If we're trapped up in it. If you have a woman who has on all black, she's got a black dress, black shoes, black stocking, black flower her hair, everything black, and she has a purse that she bought at Claire's that's brown, you will cut her up and laugh at her. But if she has a Louis Vuitton purse on that costs $6,000, wow, look at her in that purse. That looks so good. No, it does not match, but you like that brand. You like that brand. And majority of people can't tell you anything about the leather that the bag's made out of. They can't tell you the sticks. They can't tell you the metal. They can't tell you why that purse is better than the one in Ross, but it's Louis Vuitton. And you're walking around with them. And I'm not dissing the brand. I'm helping us understand where we are in our thinking. That's why we must have our minds transformed and be renewed so we can have the mind of Christ, not the mind of this world, for the good That's what it's got to do with you. This is a 
real experience. This is authentic. This is real. That's what separates the fake from the phone. You say, well, I don't, I don't get why you, you say it has to be in Jesus' name. Because every place you find somebody being baptized in the Holy Bible, they are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That is authentic. That's not a bootleg. That's not a copy of a copy. Back when I was growing up, we didn't have MP3 players and things. We had ghetto blasters that had a microphone on it. And what we would do is if we'd hear a song on the radio or coming out mom's eight track or off the LP, we would hold that up, press play, record at the same time, and then when the song came, you would bam, hit the pause. When it comes off, bam, hit the pause again. And we copied the song. Now if you take that tape and you make another copy that you give to your friend and the girl you like, what you're doing is you're lessening the quality of something that was already a copy. So when you hear the hisses, and all this other thing called white noise. And a lot of times that's what happens to us because we're not hearing the real authentic. We're hearing watered down preaching. We're hearing skim milk. We're hearing Kool Aid. We're not reading the Bible. We're not hearing the Word of God. So what we're reading is almost right and it's always wrong because it's nothing but a bootleg copy. We're an identity crisis in this world, church. If I myself today choose to call myself Barack Obama the second and go down to DMV and change my name, it does not change my relationship to him. It doesn't change my relationship to my wife, to my daughters, and to my parents. It doesn't make me his son. I am still my daughter's father because of my blood and my wife's flesh. And this church was bought by his blood. He came through her flesh, through his blood, so he can have a new birth experience, church. This is authentic. This is not a bootleg. And if you think there's any other way, you are in an identity crisis. Crisis is what happens when all pandemonium and order obliviate and it's no longer in existence. People start moving in crisis mode. And you don't think rationally. Why? Because now you're just existing and you're fighting for your life. Not making sound decisions. Not line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, but moving spontaneously, so to speak, freestyling your life. And this is contrary to the word of God. There's order. God is king on his decisions on how he wants to react to situations. We have this great book called the Bible. You should read it sometime. And in this Bible, it's a story of great men who have been in different situations. And in these different situations, different men have responded to the voice of God in ways that was advantageous for them to get out of their crisis so that they could become victorious. Hallelujah. That just went over like a cement cloud. But I'm here to tell you it's the truth. Hallelujah. 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 And you know one of the things that I find even funny with knockoffs is there's different levels of knockoffs and bootlegs that people will buy into. Yeah. <laughs> you go spend a hundred dollars on a bootleg and you put that on eBay and tell them you want your hundred dollars back for that bootleg. Yeah, that's not happening. You go buy something real, authentic, documented with papers, you will get more than what you paid if you sit on it long enough. It's just like your relationship with the Lord. You get in here, you get plugged in, you keep it real, you keep it authentic, and it will be worth more than what it came in this door last. It might have come in this door with a skirt here and everything showing, but when it got into this altar, it was a sister with long hair speaking with flowing tongues of fire. It might have come in here a brother that smelled like a blunt. It might have come in here a brother looking at every female in here, but what happens is through time it turns into someone who says, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, man. No, man. We found an old running cross. We found an altar and identified with the voice of the shepherd who called him. He said, I might be a sheep, but thy rod and thy staff, they go with me and you prepare a place for me in the presence of my enemy. Why? Because thou art with me. Hallelujah. Now my preliminary to 
done, and it's time for me to start preaching to y'all. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 In talking with Brother Mac the other day, we were talking about Johnny James, and I like preachers that are just way out and say some crazy stuff. He can get away with saying some cool stuff. Remember hearing one of his tapes one day, he said, people were talking, Brother James, why you always quote so many scriptures? He said, because that's the only time y'all are going to get the word. <laughs> Man, if I came up in here, y'all have me for Tuesday night dinner, but I'm going to have fun with it tonight, just be me. Is that all right? Yeah. Hallelujah. Ephesians 3. 3 through 21, I'm not going to ask you to stand, I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to give you a brief rundown of what is being said there. By revelation, Jesus showed him who he was, I'm speaking to Paul, what Paul is, what Paul can do through the church, through God, what the church should do, and how we're going to do it. In this, he goes to define that we must have a boldness to be proud of who we are in him our apostolic identity. We are the church. We know the truth. We're right. We have the original. We're not a bootleg. You say, what has this got to do with me? Where are we going? I'm talking about unity in here. Unity of ourselves and aligning it with God. Because if we don't align ourselves as individuals with God, we cannot by default have unity with each other. Ephesians 4 and 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There is one God who is doing a lot of different things at one time for everybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Ephesians 4 and 4, he says, even as you are called in one hope of your call. Even as you are called, what do you expect that I want you to do? Hear my voice, is what the Lord is saying. Hear my voice. Hear my voice. You say, well, I might not speak English good. I might be too old. I might be too young. I get scared speaking in public. It's okay. Do what you can where you are at, but make sure you are doing something. Make sure you are doing something. All of us have a part in this kingdom. Not everybody was called the pastor. Not everybody was called to teach. Not everybody was called to preach. I was definitely not called to sing. But everybody can do something in here. And everybody is doing something in here. Don't get me wrong. But there's fear amongst us that needs to be squashed. Because not everybody is the same. We are all individuals with unique talents and abilities to do great things for the kingdom of God. But we need to identify who we are in Him so that we can be productive members of this body. Hallelujah. We got nothing to be ashamed of. You got a list? So what? So what? You stutter? So what? You can't sing? Can you push a broom? Can you push a mop? Can you pick up a chair? Can you shake a hand and clean up after yourself in the bathroom? Do what you can do and don't be ashamed. Just be the best you can possibly be. For His sake. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One version of Ephesians 4 reads, He makes the whole body fit together and unites it through the support of every joint as each and every part does its job. He makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So I tell you and encourage you in the Lord's name not to live any longer like other people in the world. Their minds are set on worthless things. They can't understand because they're in the dark. They're excluded from the light that God approves of because of ignorance and stubbornness. 
And ignorance and stubbornness is a lack of knowledge, it's callousness, it's a hardened heart. And God has made a way out of this identity crisis for us. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 53 and 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on himself the sins of us all. Everybody has messed up at some point or another. They've lost their identity. There's a crisis going on. But God has made himself man and took the sins of all mankind to be that sacrifice for us so that we can have our sins repented. This is the gospel. This is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. It's pretty simple. Matthew 9 and 36. I will have compassion on them. Meaning I will have my bowels inside of me. All my inward parts are going to be twisted up inside. And it's going to hurt me and it's going to move me to act. Is what Jesus is saying. For these people are harassed, confused, and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. Without a teacher. Without someone to guide without someone to help, without someone to encourage, and without someone to feed them. What does that mean? That for thousands of years, people have been people. All right. People have been people. And we need help. We need encouragement. We need to be taught. We need to be led. We need to be fed. We need to be hugged. We need to be guided. We need these things. We are not sheep, but we are like sheep in the fact that we can't defend ourselves without the power of the Holy Ghost in our life. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is a spiritual war we're fighting. And God is a spirit. And we cannot be victorious unless we identify with who he is, what he does when he comes upon us, and the ability that he gives us to be victorious in this life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People are confused, they're lonely and uneducated and uninformed, and at times we're even pitiful, selfish creatures. And sometimes we forget that if we think of ourselves as educated. We think of ourselves as better than that, or we label things with a status quo on how things should be and give it a social status because we don't want to offend or increase accountability a lot of times and say we don't know. Young people and old alike, it is okay not to know. It is okay not to know something. And it's a lot better to say, I don't know, can you help me? Can you show me? Right. Than giving somebody some fabricated answer. How do you get to Henderson? I don't know, take the 95 North. Okay. I don't know, but let me see, let's Google it. Something. If you don't know, you know what, I don't know, but I think he knows, and I think he said he lived down there. Where am I going with that? I don't understand this whole doctrine that you preach. I don't understand. What does this mean? That's a start. I didn't understand one lick of it when I walked up in here. And it didn't come by hearing it time in and time out. It helped. But what it came from was me understanding who God is, right. letting down my pride and admitting I don't know, right. asking for help, seeking, knocking, looking, searching, praying, asking, falling, getting back up time in and time out. And what happens is you get a revelation of who he is in proportion to where you're at. started in the thesis statement and I'm going to throw one in the body here. Our identity is a result of blood and flesh. But fear of the unknown causes many tremors in our mind due to lack of preparation that causes panic. And panic turns the easy routine into crisis because most of the time what truly is the situation at hand is not addressed because our lack of internalization from lack of revelation which is a direct result of procrastination has a scurrying about to protect our so-called identity which
which in essence is truly just a facade. We are faced with an epidemic of an identity crisis that has grown out of proportion. Yes. Right. Hallelujah. What's the solution to this? Identifying that we are like sheep in need of a shepherd. John 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he that entereth in the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Verse 4. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yeah. Brother Don. Come up here. Brother Joel, come up here. Zanth, come here, please. Hallelujah. It's time we take a look at the 23rd Psalm through the eyes of a shepherd on what God is really saying to us. Back in the days, back in the days when a shepherd would be out with his sheep, when he would get tired, he would take them to eat. He would take them to drink. He would be there with his rod and his staff to protect them and lead them to a place to eat, a place to sleep, a dry ground. And he would take the stones and he would build a little corral to hold the sheep in. And what he would do is he would have two pillars, two posts. And at night, he would lay down between these two posts. So if one of the sheep tried to come out, or the big bad wolf came to get past the threshold, he was right there. So what would happen is if one of the sheep came to come like this, he would say, Sandra. And he would park it all night. Sandra, you know I love you. You know Jesus loves you. You came to church, baby. And he would hold this sheep like that all night. Why? Because the sheep identified in his voice. By who? His shepherd. Who? God. Who does God appoint to lead us besides still what? A pastor. Not brother, but a pastor. Not a brother blizzard, but a pastor blizzard. Why? Because we are like sheep gone astray. And we need to be led to the green pastures. We need to be led by still waters. Why? Because the Lord restores our soul from when we were in a fallen state. Why? For his name's sake. Not for the shepherd's name's sake. Not for the pastor's name's sake. But God does this because Jesus' name is at stake. With these brands, Louis Vuitton is at stake. Coaches at stake. You go out there and you try to open up a, 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 a coffee shop out here and you make yourself a frappuccino and you watch yourself get served next week. Because their name's at stake. Their reputation's at stake. The government is upon his back, not mine. I'm behind him. God's got it under control. He knows what he's doing. Why? Because he is preparing a place for me where? in the presence of my enemies. 
So I don't need to fear what this world can do to me. Church, you do not need to fear what is being pumped in your face day in and day out. God ain't no pump, and the church ain't made of no pumps. <laughs> David got happy when he walked through the valley in the shadow of death because he kept drawn back on every time he was hungry, every time he was scared that there was the rod of the Lord that came and struck down the enemies. A shepherd uses a rod to beat off the mountain lions that are trying to come into the herd. He uses the rod to beat off the wolves that are coming into the herd. But what he uses the staff for is when they're caught up in the thickets to pull them by their feet, to pull them out, to knock their feet out from under them, bring them down low so he can pick them up. And then he carries them again. He says, it's going to be all right. 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 Why? so that they can know his voice and identify with him. Because there's going to be wolves that are going to come up in the flock. And a wolf in sheep's clothing is still a wolf. That's why there's pillars. That's why there's a fence. That's why we can identify with who the Lord is by those that have been washed in the blood like that blood on the doorpost to identify this is sanctified, this is separated, this is holy unto God. There's a reason why things are done. Hallelujah. Several more lessons in this series to go over. But in closing, what he says is, God's going to anoint his head with oil. And every time in scripture that we see oil being used to signify the Holy Ghost, what's the oil for? What's it got to do with sheep and the shepherd? When sheep are out in the backside of a mountain in the hot day, they sweat. And the nose gets wet. And little flies come and land and try to drink on it. And they lay larvae in that nose. And then those little maggots grow into the nose and into the brain of the sheep. And then the sheep start to get worried and frantic and start banging their head against the rocks. And it makes all the other sheep scared. So what the good shepherd does is he anoints their head with oil. He lubricates their head. He washes out the flies so there's nothing for the flies to come land on. So this Holy Ghost oil, this power from on high that the Lord anoints his with, gives us power and the ability to prevent all these parasites, a.k.a. sin, from getting a hold of us and laying a hold and taking root and growing up inside. Because it's the little things like the foxes Solomon said that spoil it all. Hallelujah. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can stand to your feet. A rod and a staff do a couple things for Shepherd when he's out there. The rod is his defense tool. The staff is what he uses to help and to pick up. But I can't help but think that the Lord has given us that illustration to realize that when we lean on the cross, the rod, the staff, what do they do? They comfort us. When we're tired, when we're weak, when we're weary, we can lean on it. We used to sing a song back in the day, lean on me. What happened? I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on, lean on me. It was for a reason. Why? Because we get tired, like Brother Swin said. We get tired of getting beat up on. We're human, church. There's power in this word. There is no victory ever going to be wrought your life until you can identify 
the power in the word. Until you can identify your position and your identity as a child of a living God. Nothing a preacher could say or do to make you swallow it, to eat it, to make it develop, to make it grow. My little daughter turned five and a little party four. If she don't want to eat, I can't make her swallow it. Pastor can't make us swallow this either. I can't make you swallow it. But I hope that it can be sweet on your lips. Yes. And it'll make a little bit of sense for you to draw back on and take a drink sometime. And get deeper in your walk with him. And appreciate the beautiful, eloquent words in this Bible. There is power in these words. Pastor. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. If you know who you are, don't try to mix and mingle with the world because you're not going to fit in. You don't have an identity crisis whenever you're trying to look like the world. Let me tell you something. The problem with being apostolic is that you know too much. You never go back and be happy where you came out of. Or you go back to the parties, you do everything everybody else does. While they're having a good time, you're sitting there miserable knowing Jesus is coming. And I'm not ready to go. And I'm not right. Don't blur the lines. Don't go back. The Bible said, come out from among them and be you separate, said the Lord. I receive you unto myself. He said he would be a father to you. Get your identity down as to who you are. Get your identity down as to who you are. 